26 years, Marco Polo, his father Niccolo, and his uncle Maffeo lived at the magnificent court of Kublai Khan, lord of the mighty Mongol Empire. Anxious to see their native land again, they finally persuaded the aging emperor to send them home. When he saw that they were ready to leave, the great Khan gave them two tablets proclaiming that they might travel freely throughout his realm, and that wherever they went, they should receive provisions for themselves and their attendants. He gave them messages for the Pope and the kings of France, Spain, and the rest of Christendom, and then he fitted out a mighty fleet of ships to carry them and their possessions back to Italy. As the fleet pulled out to sea, both sides knew that they would never see each other again. After three long and arduous years, they finally disembarked at Venice, amazing their fellow citizens who had long ago given them up for dead. Marco Polo's journals, written after his return from the East, were published soon after his death and contained many fine illustrations of his travels. What was the world like in 1295, the year Marco Polo returned home to Venice? The most striking feature was the existence of the Mongol Empire, a state which linked China with Europe for the first and only time in history. The great Khans, rulers of this, the greatest empire ever known, made sure that the routes through their immense possessions were entirely safe by day or night. Western artists pictured the steppes of Asia peopled by bizarre creatures like this headless man with his face on his chest. Travellers were not put off by such wild imaginings, however, and contacts between East and West multiplied. The Khans were themselves curious to learn about the world beyond their frontiers. Marco Polo tells us that he kept notebooks during his many travels around the lands of Kublai Khan in which he recorded the curious habits and customs of people in distant lands, as Kublai enjoyed hearing about them far more than reading the reports of his ambassadors and officials. Although the present-day Forbidden City has been both enlarged and rebuilt since the time of Kublai Khan, it stands on the site of his imperial palace in Peking. Polo was not the only European to visit the palace during Kublai Khan's long rule. From the 1240s, when the Mongols first attacked Europe, missionaries were sent eastwards in an attempt to convert the invaders to Christianity. They met with some success, and the Pope appointed a succession of archbishops of Peking, who gradually built up a small congregation of believers. But the majority of the visitors to Peking were the merchants and their wives, who came all the way to China in search of luxuries like silk and porcelain. Many of them died in the East and were buried there, like Catherine Veloni, whose hybrid Chinese and Latin tombstone in Yang Chao still marks the place where she was buried in 1342. But, sadly, the century of Mongol peace came to an end. Kublai Khan died in 1294 at the age of 80. His successors failed to retain a grip on areas outside China. Then, in 1368, they were driven out of China altogether. No more Europeans followed the Silk Road to Cathay, because without the protection of the Khans, it was no longer safe. This need not have been a catastrophe for the West. Spices still arrived by sea from India, and the Venetian fleet still numbered several hundred vessels, most of them built in the Republic's vast shipyard, the Arsenal, the biggest industrial complex in the whole of Europe. The galleys constructed there undertook regular voyages to France, Spain and Portugal, Flanders and England, carrying eastern wares. These were no longer just silks and spices. The Genoese and Venetian forts and trading stations around the shores of the Black Sea now exported increasing quantities of grain and caviar into the Mediterranean. <laughs> 
But most of all, they shipped slaves from the Caucasus. Georgians, Circassians, Russians. This callous trading in human life was only interrupted, along with everything else in Europe, by a calamity which began in the year 1347. Tens of millions died of the Black Death in Europe alone. Many towns saw half their population die. Some monasteries lost all but one or two of their monks. Everywhere, death became an obsession beyond control or comprehension. Some villages were entirely wiped off the map, becoming the deserted medieval villages whose ridge and furrow fields are all that now remain. The chronicler Foissart, writing soon after the event, believed that a third of the world died. Agnoli di Tura, writing his chronicle in Siena while the horror still lasted, was even more alarmist. This, he wrote, is the end of the world. Considering the scale of the disaster, it's curious that there is still no agreement on how it started. Certainly it came to Europe from Asia, but how? The most likely theory is that the first European carriers were a group of Genoese who returned to Sicily after the siege of their fortress at Caffa in the Crimea. They reported that the Mongol besiegers suddenly began to die of a strange disease that gave its victims black swellings that oozed blood and caused unbearable pain until they died. In desperation, the Mongols hurled the rotting corpses of their own dead over the city walls by giant catapult. A small party of Genoese survivors managed to escape from Kappa. As they made their way to Sicily, the terrible plague raged amongst them. By the time they reached their destination, most of them were dead. Having travelled remorselessly across Asia, the Black Death had arrived in Europe. Before the end of the year, it had reached the mainland. In relentless sweeps, it travelled to the far corners of the continent and to the furthest islands beyond. Few places escaped but amongst them were parts of Poland and northern Italy. By 1353, when the pestilence finally abated, perhaps 20 million Europeans from Scotland to Spain and from Ireland to Crete had been claimed by the Black Death. It's still widely believed that the disease was bubonic plague, and that it was spread by a deadly parasite carried in the stomach of a flea that was attracted to both rats and to men. The best defense against it was therefore to kill all rats and to avoid all places such as houses where they lived. Instead, most people killed dogs and cats in the belief that they were the source of infection. The rats therefore multiplied still further. And instead of travelling into the countryside and sleeping rough, like the sensible storytellers in Boccaccio's Decameron, set during the plague, most people stayed at home, like Boccaccio's mistress, Fiametta, and like her, they died. How many brave men and fair ladies, the poet wrote disconsolately, whom any physician would have pronounced in the soundest of health, 
ate breakfast with their kinsfolk, comrades and friends in the morning, and when evening came, shared supper with their forefathers in the other world. The Black Death was by no means the only disaster to strike Europe during the 14th century. By the year 1300, the continent was almost certainly overpopulated. A century or more of unbroken economic growth had produced a rapid increase in population, especially in the cities. It became increasingly hard to feed them. Between 1315 and 1319, a run of bad harvests caused famines and epidemics. As the century advanced, harvest failures became more frequent. The poor ate whatever they could lay their hands on. Dogs, cats, grass, even, it was said, their own children. Yet in spite of famine and plague, there still seemed to be plenty of people left to wage wars. Few years passed in the 14th century without a battle being fought somewhere in Europe. And some wars lasted for generations. The struggle between England and France that began in 1337, popularly known as the Hundred Years' War, in fact lasted until 1453. Most of the leading episodes were recorded by historians like Jean Wavrin or Jean Foissart, whose beautifully illustrated chronicles were copied many times and seemed to be equally in demand among the warriors of both sides. During the rare periods when England was at peace with France, her young men could always find employment fighting wars abroad. In Switzerland in the 1370s, they fought the men of Bern in a series of furious actions. The English wore hooded cloaks over their suits of armor as protection from the cold, so that they became known in history as the Googler, the hooded men. In Italy, soldiers of fortune, mainly Englishmen, were led by Sir John Hawkwood, and their brutal deeds in the service of many North Italian princes were later narrated with little embroidery by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in his book, The White Company. While Western Europe suffered recession, plague, and ruinous wars, the southeastern parts of the continent finally fell under Muslim rule, as the Ottoman Turks, a nomadic people from the steppes of Asia, steadily conquered the last Byzantine territory around Constantinople. By 1450, all that was left of the once mighty Byzantine Empire, which had endured for a thousand years, was the city of Constantinople itself, defended by its magnificent walls. The Turks settled down to a long siege, hoping to force the city to surrender before aid for the defenders arrived from the west. Eventually, in 1453, an all-out assault on the walls was successful. Constantinople, the capital built by the first Christian emperor, now became a Muslim city, soon to be renamed Istanbul. It was a shattering blow to Christian pride, and it also dealt a considerable reverse to Christian trade. The Western merchants lost all their trading concessions in the Near East. The Venetian Republic was amongst the worst affected, being the most exposed and vulnerable of the European powers in the contest between Islam and Christianity. As a maritime community dependent overwhelmingly on the trade in spices and exotic goods from the East, she required an equitable relationship with the Islamic world in order to survive. She wanted the Islamic world to see her not as an Eastern outpost of Christendom, but as a neutral service industry. For a time, this precarious policy paid off, but as the Turkish advance continued, criticism of the Republic mounted. Alas, Phoenicians, wrote Pope Pius II in 1463, how your ancient character is debased. Too much trading with the Turk has made you the friend of the infidel. Siamo Veneziani, poi Cristiani, retorted the Venetians. We are Venetians first and Christians afterwards. The city of the lagoons tried to survive by building extensive fortifications along the Adriatic to keep the Turks out, while continuing trade with friendly nations further east. But as the Ottoman advance continued, their trade with the east temporarily collapsed. 
Venice's chief rival for the trade of the Orient, the Republic of Genoa, reacted to the rise of the Ottoman power in a totally different way. Steadily, her merchants shifted their financial interests and their commerce from east to west. In 1489, they even sold their rights in Cyprus to Venice. Instead, they invested heavily in voyages of exploration undertaken by Portuguese mariners down the west coast of Africa. The leading figure in this expansion was Prince Henry, head of the largest crusading order in Portugal. He was anxious to carve out some territory for himself at the expense of Islam, both to gain converts to Christianity and to acquire wealth for himself. First, in the 1420s, he sent settlers to occupy the islands of the Azores, Madeira and the Canaries, both to prevent them falling into Muslim hands and to produce revenues for his cause. With the aid of Genoese capital and experience, the islands before long began to export rich cargoes of wood, dye, sugar, and eventually Madeira wine. Prince Henry, who was later to be called Henry the Navigator, began to send the ships used for the island trade southwards down the coast of Africa. In 1434, they passed Cape Bojador, the furthest point previously known to Europeans. In 1444, they passed Cape Verde, and in 1460, they reached Sierra Leone. Henry the Navigator's captains had traveled 2,000 miles down the coast of Africa. By now, the primary motive was no longer religion or curiosity. It was gain. Soon, several thousand slaves were being shipped from the coastal plain beyond Cape Verde to Portugal every year the Portuguese government began to take a direct interest in sending more ships further south. From 1470 onwards, a succession of intrepid Portuguese explorers advanced steadily down the hitherto uncharted west coast of Africa. Their journeys into the unknown were rigorous and daunting. But progress continued, until finally, in 1488, Captain Bartolomeu Dias rounded the Cape of Good Hope. At his furthest landing place, Diaz erected a large stone cross bearing the arms of Portugal, as he and his predecessors had done throughout their voyages. These crosses, or padroish, now dotted the African coast for several thousand miles. Beyond the Slave River, nothing was found to match the gold and the Negroes of Guinea. But the desire to continue was unaffected by reduced profits. The Portuguese now hoped to find, beyond the tip of Africa, a sea route to India. It's hard for someone living in the 20th century to imagine how the world looked to Diaz's contemporaries. Well over a thousand years before the Portuguese exploration of West Africa began, the Roman geographer Strabo had drawn a map of the known world, stretching from northern Britain across Europe and North Africa to India. He had guessed that the African continent was surrounded by water, as this reconstruction based upon his writings clearly shows. But Africa is shown as Libya only. The Egyptian Ptolemy, writing in the 2nd century AD, shows a slightly expanded area of known world, but he disagrees with Strabo about Africa. Ptolemy shows the continent running right off the bottom of the map and joined to Asia by a land bridge. For more than a thousand years, the works of these classical cartographers were simply lost to Western man, a victim of the centuries of upheaval that desolated Europe. When they were rediscovered in the early 15th century, it was the theories of Ptolemy that became the basis of world geography. By sailing round the southern tip of Africa, Diaz had proved Ptolemy wrong. This map, drawn by the German cartographer Martellus around the year 1490, shows the western coastline of Africa sweeping down to the Cape and the beginning of the sea route to India and the east. The voyage of Diaz had placed the matter beyond doubt. His success, however, could not be followed up at once. Diaz's little ships had been almost destroyed by the tremendous seas of the Cape, which Diaz aptly christened the Cape of Storms, and he advised the king to build a fleet of larger ships for the passage to India. He also pointed out that they would need to be equipped with heavy artillery, since the Indian Ocean was known to be the preserve of powerful Muslim merchantmen. <laughs> 
It all took time to prepare. Portugal could not afford to fail. Not until 1497 did a powerful fleet, commanded by the court nobleman Vasco da Gama, set sail from Lisbon. Within two years, the voyages were back, bearing spice and silk and full of conviction that with more ships and more guns, the entire seaborne trade of India could be brought under Portuguese control. In 1500, a fleet of 14 vessels under Pedro Alvarez Cabral, pausing only to claim Brazil for his master on the way, began to establish Portuguese control over all shipping in Asian waters. But there was already, by this time, another European who claimed to have discovered a sea route to Asia. His name was Christopher Columbus. He was one of the many Genoese who entered Portuguese service in the 15th century. About the year 1487, when he was 36 years old, Columbus became convinced that 3,000 miles west of Lisbon, a navigator would discover Japan. By now, educated men had generally come to the conclusion that the world was not flat, as had often been believed, but that it was in fact round. However, Columbus believed the circumference to be only 20,000 miles, which is approximately 20% smaller than we now know it to be. These mistaken beliefs, combined with navigational errors by earlier explorers, led Columbus to think that the distance from Portugal to the eastern coast of China was some 16,000 miles and not the 7,000 miles it actually is. Therefore, on Columbus' calculations, this journey would have taken him three quarters of the way around the globe. Small wonder then that when he had sailed his 3,000 miles due west and come across the coast of Cuba, he assumed it was China and sent an embassy ashore to find the representative of the great Khan. But in 1487, these discoveries lay in the future. The Portuguese Council of State rejected Columbus' theory. For five years, Columbus, disappointed, toured the capitals of Europe in search of a patron. Finally, in 1492, he found one in Spain, Isabella of Castile. She created Columbus her Admiral of the Ocean Sea and gave him three ships with which to sail to his Indies. At last, Columbus was bound for immortality. In a succession of voyages, he was eventually able to claim the discovery of a new continent, America. In less than half a century, a handful of explorers from the Italian and Iberian peninsulas had knotted together a string of hitherto divided regions into a global system that would never be broken. Europeans, Africans, Asians and Americans all came into contact with each other's products, beliefs and prejudices. It was by no means an exchange that brought only advantages, even to the dominant European cultures and nations. And for those who were to be discovered, the Africans and Americans in particular, the gains would be few, if any, and the losses were to be catastrophic. <laughs>